Mm-hmm. Hey guys, it's me, Linda, and I'm here with one of Jupiter's sisters. Her name is Kia. I just want to make a safe space where she feels comfortable. And I hope that you guys will take what she says. And, and if you're going through the things that she went through, really, I hope you can learn from her story and maybe grow from her story. I think it's very inspiring. So this is Kia. Hello. She's really sweet. I really love talking to her. We've become friends and I just want to ask her some of your guys' questions today. And we're going to get to know more about Kia. So there's about like a one year age difference, right? Yeah. So that means you guys went to like some, the same schools and the same like um, grades, right? Yeah. So with the cutoff for my specific school, um, I missed it by a month. Otherwise, we would have been in the same grade. So kind of explain like your your childhood with Corbin and explain if there was a turning point where you noticed changes in his behavior. I mean, we had like a fairly okay childhood. I mean, yes, him and I have some sexual abuse trauma. We have very similar trauma. I have a little bit more than he does. Our brother, Junior, um, or Shane, as most people know him, uh, he wasn't a very good brother, so to speak. But that happened, I think I was three and Corbin was four and that kind of went on until we were nine and ten. So um, for the most part, we did normal things. He was into more video games and where I was more athletic. I liked sports. So I mean, like other than home, we didn't hang out a lot. I mean, there was a point in time when we were like little, little where we were like best friends. I have pictures of us like constantly being together. Is there like a a certain age that things started to get, you know, a little weird between you two? When I was kind of preteen, teenage years, um, I started noticing a lot of favoritism between my mom's relationship with me and my sisters to her relationship with her and Corbin. Um, I know that she did spoil him a lot. um, And she was called out on it a lot growing up by our oldest siblings. Um, The oldest ones being 23 and 20 years older than I am. So, I mean, she would get called out on it. She'd be like, oh, I'm not, I'm not treating anyone any differently, but it was very obvious she was. So what I learned is, you know, you and Corbin have a lot of siblings and correct me if I'm wrong, but like, um, so the three of you were um, adopted from the same family. And so you, you know, you, you three were, you know, raised together in um, this house with um, a few other siblings, right? With Jupiter and me and Junior, we have two siblings that came from the same family. So we were adopted as a unit of five into a family of five. The oldest was 18 when we entered the home. So basically how it went was you were the youngest and then it was Jupiter and then it was Junior. So when you and Jupiter were growing up, because you were similarly like in a similar age range, can you, you mentioned that you were um, sexually, you know, abused. Mm -hmm. Um, Was that by your, your older brother, Junior? Yes, that was by Junior. Um, Junior. And that's the one that's in jail right now for. Yes. Yes, that is correct. I just want to say to like everybody watching that, I think that, you know, you are a very strong person. I've heard a lot about what you've, what you've been through and, you know, you're, you're writing a book about all your experiences with the family. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's get into how you were treated by the rest of your family members. So you had a great relationship with Jupiter when you were younger and then 
when things started escalating, you were, you know, cast aside, right? I mean, I had a good relationship for the most part with all of my siblings. There was like a turning point, like, I guess I was like 10, maybe 11 years old, where my mom did favor him a lot more and I was noticing it. I also noticed my dad didn't favor him and it would make my mom angry. But for the most part, my siblings, they tried to treat us all fairly. Um, I mean, I did, I quarreled with them as siblings do. Corbin's kind of always had anger issues ever since like we were like really tiny. Um, they started getting worse and worse because mom would say things like, he's autistic, he doesn't know what he's doing. But then I'm sure that everyone like can very well tell he does indeed know what he's doing. I would be sitting on the complete opposite side of the room, coloring, he'd lose a game and he'd walk over and he'd throw whatever remote he had in his hands at my head. And I would tell my mom and my mom would call him into her office. She would scold him and then nothing would happen. So basically he was, he was coddled his whole life by his mom and, and oh, yeah. that made a huge impact on the person who he is today. What you said about his, his mom's excuse about um, he's autistic. He doesn't know better. He has used that to this day to defend his actions. Oh, I know. It's a big reason why I don't talk to my family, but once in a blue moon. And it's also a big reason why I kind of left my family. Yeah. Because of the coddlement of my brother. Someone asked, what was life before Jupiter was, they said, weird? Was it peaceful? Was it calm before he started being favorited, before he started being coddled? Was there ever a before or was he always coddled like that? I want to say he's always been coddled like that. My siblings have always told me that he's always been coddled. I didn't see it personally until we were later on in our years, like nine, 10. There was a lot of times where we would hang out. We would go do normal kid stuff. Like I have videos when we were kids, like home videos. There's good memories. There's like, he was a normal kid. We were really creative, really funny kids. And I can tell it, it's hard for you to put those in the past because that's not the person he is today. It might still be somewhere inside of him, but you know, all the good memories that you remember have been tarnished by, you know, the things he did after that. It's kind of like he just flipped a switch. It sounds like good memories that you had with him. And it's so sad that that person that he was when he was younger isn't the person he is today. He's not as fun now. Let's just say no, that. He's, he's, he's not as fun. He's kind of a jerk now. I kind of wanted to get into some of the questions that I have. He's, you know, I've, I've talked with him a bunch on online, on, on FaceTime and things like that. And mm -hmm. he's mentioned a few things about his family. There were a lot of times where we would start like flirting or talking, you know, kind of sexually a little bit. And mm -hmm. he would, the next thing he would bring up is his sister's. And a lot of my viewers found that really weird that a lot of times when he would start flirting, he would bring up his sisters. Like one time he said, my sister got stuck in the dryer and one of his sisters says, thanks for not effing me. So just, he brought up weird things with his, with sisters and people just thought that that was weird. Well, I can just clear that up and say that none of that happened. Uh, aside from Junior and what happened with Junior, nothing else sexual happened between us mm -hmm. um, other than when he got older and when I got older and started developing more, like reaching our puberty stages, then he would attempt to like rope me or my sisters um it got so bad where I actually had to get my dad involved 
because I would tell my mom and she'd be like, he just doesn't know what he's doing. You yeah. just got to repeat, repeat. And so I finally uh, ended up telling my dad and my dad said, well, if he does it, just go ahead and smack him. So I did never touched me like that again. So your, your mom was pretty much on the Corbin, the Corbin train and your dad was, you know, rooting for, for all of his daughters and sons. So it's pretty sad to see that, you know, you were never treated equally by your mother. You know, you said that he, he started to touch you inappropriately in in places that, you know, uh, a a brother should not touch you. Was, Mm -hmm. was that happening often um, before you slapped him? It happened really frequently I can't pinpoint like how often I just know that it happened often enough where I was having like bruises of different colors on my body from him was he playful about it or was he like deviant about it it would start out as he wanted like a hug or something eventually I just stopped giving him hugs because it got so bad but he would want hugs and he would put his hands where they didn't belong um and then we would call him out on it and he'd be like I'm sorry I'm sorry like kind of like what he's doing now I've seen a few of the videos kind of like what he's doing now where I'm sorry I'm sorry I won't do it again then immediately does it again and that's very sad to hear that that happened to you. Can you walk through like that night that you woke up and you found him strapped to a chair? But what had happened was my mom had just gotten home. She was heading back down the hallway to the bathroom. And she happened to look over at the boys' door. And on the door was a sign that said, don't come in. We are playing naked. Well, she opened the door. Shane had used, I think, their ties to tie him up to the chair and was um, touching him inappropriately and touching himself inappropriately with no clothes on. And so that kind of raised my mother's awareness to what was going on. That, you know, must have been so traumatizing for you to see. Did that happen only once or do you think it was happening repeatedly where Junior, a.k.a. Shane, was, you know, touching Corbin, a.k.a. Jupiter, um, inappropriately? I mean, with as much as it was happening to me, I don't doubt it. And it was really hard to determine when it started, how it started, and how long it had been going on because the boys shared a room. Corbin was on the top bunk and Junior was on the bottom. Do you want to share what what happened with you and and Shane? I remember the first time it happened to me. Um, I don't know how old I was, but I remember we were outside. We're jumping on the trampolines and the sprinklers were going, so it was summertime. We were in our swimmers. Shane told us, so us being me and Corbin, our swimming suits were dirty and we needed to take them off. I'm like, okay, like my brain is like, okay, let's go inside and do that and come back out with a clean suit on. He's like, no, it's okay. Just take them off and leave them here on the trampoline. And the sprinklers will wash them off. And so we did, being kids. Junior took Corbin up into, we had like this treehouse play center. He took him up there. I don't know what they were doing, but I know after a while, Junior came back down and tried to get me to go up in there with them. And I said no and ran away like a smart person so even as a young child you knew that something was probably going on in that tree house that shouldn't have been and that's why you ran away I know just from 
recent encounters with my biological family that Junior and my older sisters, when they were younger and living with my biological family, that he would tie them up. And that's probably where that came from. Like oh, your sorry. biological father would tie up your siblings Thanks. just to keep them in one place? I have no idea. I don't I don't know the answer to that. Um, I did talk to my biological father and explain some of the things that Junior did. And my biological father was like, oh, that's probably my fault. I used to tie up your siblings and make them escape from it or something like that. Don't remember all the conversation. Yeah. My my biological parents are another story. Yeah. Um, and he's the guy that says that that claims that you and your siblings are half black. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sounds he's a great. little uh, he's a little bit of a fruit loop. It runs the family a little bit. Yeah, it's a little bit. I mean, I've been talking with my biological father, and he does say that a lot of the men, specifically the men in my family, my biological family, are predators. Let's talk about your, you know, your breaking point when you had, when you decided to leave your family. After my mom died, things kind of just escalated. Just with mm-hmm. my entire family, like I was under a lot of emotions, not just from my family, but kind of, I felt like I had no purpose and I felt like my mom's death was my fault um, because I hadn't been doing something right or she would still be here. It was, yeah. I guess, survivor's guilt. I mean, I still feel it a little bit now and then, um, but um In regards to what happened with Jupiter, I think I was like 18, 19. We were heading into town because we lived in a small town. There's two restaurants and a cafe out there and that's it. But I wanted to go somewhere for dinner and just kind of feel some form of regularness after my mom died. So we got my two sisters and me and Corbin and my dad. We were, we planned to go out to eat for my birthday. And Corbin lived the furthest. So dad picked him up, brought him to the house, got me and one sister. And then we were off to get my oldest sister. The car broke down because it ran out of gas. My oldest oldest brother um came with some gas and my dad stepped out my sister and I that were in the car decided to idle ourselves like you know like entertain ourselves while we're being idle so we started singing songs that we liked and Corbin didn't like that so he told us to stop or he'd hurt us and we didn't We told dad, because dad had opened the door to grab something. We're like, dad, he's threatening us again. He's like, oh, just ignore him. He doesn't mean anything by it. He doesn't understand what he's saying. He doesn't understand what he's doing. I'm like, no, dad. He legit will hurt us. We decided to continue with what we were doing, because, you know, that's what our dad told us to do. And Corbin grabbed the seatbelt. I was in the front seat, and he pulled it tight so I couldn't move it strangling me basically and so I took off my shoe and I hit him with it and he then turned to CR and said that he was going to strangle her next and I told him if he so much as laid a finger on her my high heel shoe that I had in my hand was going to go into his skull oh my gosh was that was that the first time he ever tried to hurt you no that was the last what was the first time Corbin was playing with some books on the shelf and I was showing my mom a song singing my mom a song while she was in the bathroom you know like kids do showing her a song and dance I had learned at daycare and Gordon just comes up and punches me right in the nose oh my gosh blood everywhere 
of course, he gets scolded. My mom cleans us up and talks about using gentle hands. No repercussion for him, no time out or anything. But the first time he tried to end my life, because that was not the first time he tried to end my life. I think I was like 10, 11, maybe 12. He started ramming my head into the door frame of his bedroom. And then there was a couple of times in between that time and the last time that he attempted. My mom had gone into surgery. She got her knees replaced and was in recovery for it. My task was to make sure that Corbin got into the shower because it had gotten so bad that some kids were making fun of him and making fun of me were having bad hygiene in school. And so dad challenged us with the task to get Corbin to take a shower. And he refused. And he chased me down and strangled me. I think I was like 16. That would put him at 17. That was probably the first time in quite a few years that Corbin had got punished. But we had all gotten punished by my dad when he got home for it. You were trying to get him in the shower, right? And he he was retaliating. He he put his hands around your neck, right? Yeah. And could you explain what that what that felt like at that time? I kind of just this is just gonna be the end. This this is it. You thought that That's he was he was finally gonna kill you. I thought that this would be also kind of a relief if he did, because then my mom would have no choice but to send him to prison. I was thinking about my sisters and my brothers and my nieces and nephews. Like, I legit had everybody that I ever knew, everybody that I ever encountered. And I just thought it just wouldn't matter anymore. You were kind of thinking, you know, I've been the scapegoat for years. I've been, I've been the one that, you know, got all the lashings, got all the hate, got all the punishments. And if this was the time that Jupiter was caught doing something bad and he got sent to prison, then losing my life would be worth it so he wouldn't have the chance to hurt others like if this is the way i'm gonna go this is the way i'm gonna go and i'd be okay with that but fortunately it wasn't and you're you're still here and you know smiling and breathing and you know living your best life i want to kind of like shift it a little bit i don't want to talk about anything deep for our next question let's talk about jupiter's scent you know, I've, I've oh, always, <laughs> I know that you, um, just looking at him, you can tell that he smells. Um, I want to hear about what his hygiene was like growing up. You know, I've heard a little bit about it from you, but I want you to recap what you told me. This is so bad. Sorry, I'm laughing, but it's just, I don't know why it's funny. I don't even know if it's awkward anymore for me. I remember both of the scents that were both of my brothers growing up. Both of them had very specific scents. Like you could walk in their room and you could know which brother was in their last. Junior had like the smell, and this is going to be really gross, but it's the smell of sweat and like a musty kind of mildew scent and the smell of like if anyone has teenage brothers I am so sorry but when they don't clean up their mess from doing what teenage boys do properly it has a very specific smell yeah and so you could definitely tell but with Corbin specifically there was those two smells but also he didn't have good bathroom habits. It would also smell like urine and fecal matter. 
Great. Sounds lovely. We had this chair that he would sit in when we were moving houses. My dad had to throw it away because it smelled like that. And we couldn't get rid of the smell. So kind of like his dirty brown mattress that he has now? Kind of, yeah. If you had to guess what was on that mattress that he had, that he has now, what made it brown? Was it the, his sweat? Was it his dirt? I think it would be probably be a little bit of fecal matter. It might be dirt. He might not be lying on that, but I'm pretty sure that it would be a little bit of fecal matter. So when you guys were older and living together, did he take showers? Yeah, dad made him get showers, fortunately for me. (laughs) But you think if it wasn't for your dad, it was, he wouldn't have showered? Yeah. I'm 100% sure. Yeah. And you mentioned something about his potty training the other day. Oh, yeah. Mom coddled him so much that he wasn't potty trained until he was 17. There was a time, point in time, where he was using the bathroom correctly 95% of the time, and then I don't know what happened, and then all of that seemed to just be thrown out the window. And so eventually it got so bad that my dad, once again, thank you to my dad, stepped in and was like mom's not gonna clean you up anymore and just threw like a pair of chonies at my brother he had like the grown-up diapers do you think that he ever grew out of wearing those diapers no he was still wearing them the last time I saw him so he could be walking around Idaho in these grandpa diapers filled with fecal matter and that wouldn't that wouldn't surprise me that his mattress is brown that it wouldn't surprise me that that is what he's doing exactly that is disgusting and I'm sorry you had to deal with that out of everything about him that was bearable for me so aside from the bad hygiene he still was probably a a torturous brother to have living with you not just from his actions but from the people around him like you his mother, as long as he was in the house living with her, all her focus and attention would be on him. After the whole incident where he tried strangling me, that was the final straw. My dad forced my mother to put him into a group facility because he was worried about the safety of me. Even after she placed him in a group home, all of her focus was on him. Were there any times where Corbin acted sexual towards you specifically. You mentioned once where you had just taken a shower and he would watch you Yeah. after. Corbin was sitting at the table. I peeked out of the door and I was like, mom, could you get Corbin to leave the kitchen for a minute? My mom's like, and my mom just goes, Corbin, don't look. And she goes, okay, you're clear. So I had forgotten my clothes in my room. I had a towel, so I was covered. I ran from the bathroom to my room, and he just watched me. I came out, and I'm like, mom told you not to look. What happened to that instruction? And he goes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It won't happen again. It happened again multiple times, and then there was one point in time where I'm just like, Corbin, if you don't leave, The kitchen, when I get dressed, I'm going to come and do something about it. You felt his watchful eyes, you know, gazing upon you every time. Do you feel like, like looking back on that time and that was the time he started touching you and groping you, right? Yeah. Around. Yeah. Do you think that he was sexually attracted to you? I just think he wanted to push and see how far and how much he could get away with. You mentioned before that he threatened to end your life a lot. Oh, yeah. All the time. All the time. Like, and it would be something as simple as singing a song or humming to myself, or we'd be in the car and 
say I was finishing a level on a game that he wanted to play and I didn't give it to him right away or we didn't me and my sisters didn't choose the movie he wanted to watch like it was constant and then all my mom would be like is Corbin don't talk like that you shouldn't say stuff like that what are some of the things that he would threaten you with strangling us with the seatbelts strangling us in general he threatened us with kitchen knives more specifically me he threatened to throw me through a window and use the broken glass to slit my throat we had these long garden shears he threatened to cut mine and my sister's throats open with them. He threatened to light me on fire. That was a new one. Creative. Threatened to drown me. Attempted to drown me. Threatened to use like apron strings. So he, he basically treated you like an object. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. He would threaten to like break our bones or smash our skull in just enough to cause damage but not kill us. And how are you dealing with that today? Do you do you have like any trauma from any of that? I have what's called CPTSD. Um, my therapists that I have been seeing have told me it's almost as bad as, if not as bad as, someone who's been in war overseas, like a prisoner of war kind of scenario. I have listened to, you know, every part of your story that you've shared with me. And I am so happy, so glad that I'm looking at you right now. And your purpose in life is to help others. And I think that you're going to do this by sharing your story. And I'm just so proud, so happy. And um, I know that you're going to do great things in this world. I'm going to try next year to get a degree in psychology oh wow and work with teens and young kids and maybe young adults who are going through similar traumas to what I have is there anything else in your past that you want to share with my audience if you have a sibling or a family member who treats you the way that I was treated or treats you unjustly to the point where you feel like your life is in danger, no matter what they say or what they do to threaten you, that is more ammo they are giving you to use in a court of law to help yourself. And there are people out there that will help you. I mean, I have my friend, I have my social workers, my mental health care workers, um there's people out there i went to a shelter right out of my family home i went to a a very secure uh shelter um i also went to what's called a justice center where uh, basically i filled out reports and got restraining orders a lot of the questions i've got is why did you get a restraining order what led you to getting a restraining order against corbin Like I said, he's always been very aggressive. He did threaten me with guns. He sent me videos of him using guns. And in that video, it was dark enough that you couldn't tell what type of gun he had. So I just showed it to a judge and the judge is like, this is weird. We're going to get you a restraining order. And that was the end of that. Basically, I was worried for my own safety and the safety of my friends. We basically covered every, mostly everything that's happened with you and Corbin in your, in your past when you lived together. Mm-hmm. Now I want to get into what's happened recently. Um, so I know that you probably, you had a restraining order that you filed in the past, let's say two or three years, right? Mm-hmm. How did you become aware of his social media presence? My oldest sister. She messaged me, she emailed me, and she goes, hey, I had to change my number. Why the heck did you have to change your number? She goes on to explain that Corbin was using her number to sign up 
for many, many different social media accounts. She and CR were getting death threats from angry parents, angry brothers, cousins, uncles. Like they were like legit getting like a lot of backlash and neither of them knew what was going on until like officers came and knocked on their doors. You found me on TikTok, right? And you reached out to me and um, we had a conversation. And then in the past few weeks, we've talked for hours on the phone. And do you think that Jupiter, aka Corbin, what do you think should happen to him after all you've heard? I think he should be held accountable. And the two sisters that I've been talking to, they both agree, quite frankly, right now with everything going on. My birth dad, if he knew where Corbin was, would kill him. And my adopted dad isn't that kind of person. Also, he wouldn't let that kind of person back into his home because we have 24 nieces and nephews who are all minors. Do you think he should like get locked away in a mental hospital or what do you think should happen to him? I honestly do not care what happens to him. Like, they could burn him at the stake and I'd be a okay with that. Like not to raise alarm bells on anyone, but just because I feel like the punishment should fit the crime. Like if they find it where they believe he needs to be on death row, that's where he needs to be. I feel like I've suffered enough and everybody else has suffered enough with the kind of person that he is that, whatever the law decides to do with him should be what they do with him. What's sad is it's September 14th and his victims, his siblings don't have any justice. He's still out there roaming the streets without Wi-Fi. As far as we know, without Wi-Fi. So let's get into it. So basically he got into a fight with his roommate that he lived with and his roommate bit him on his chest. And I I know some of this information because his ex roommate, um, the one that he got into a fight with messaged me, he was removed from his living facility. So his dad came and, um, helped him pack up all his stuff. And I think that by focusing on him being held accountable, we can help future children be safe i feel like until like someone actually steps in and does something nothing's going to change with him i've seen the apology video thank you for posting that what he did during that video and then going back and repeating the same offense is exactly what junior did to us i think you know, by having this conversation and by putting it online, I think that it will catch people's attention. And hopefully we will see the day where Jupiter gets held accountable for his actions. I hope so. I, I really do. And I think that doing it will finally not only give me a sense of peace, but will also have a lot of relief for the other victims of him and it'll probably make you feel much much safer knowing that your nephews and nieces are are safe from him let me just back here a little bit growing up he never was allowed for some reason was never allowed to be around the littles by himself I was kind of his caretaker um, in regards to whenever we'd have family get-togethers, I was in charge of making sure that none of the littles were hurt. If Jupiter was left in a room alone with a child, what do you think would happen? If they were under the age of like 10. If they annoyed him enough, I can almost guarantee that there would be a broken bone or a death of that child. 11 onward, there might be more grooming or 
something far worse. But if it's older, like 17, 16, 15, they might be able to kick his butt and come out okay. But younger, probably not. So if a young child was left alone in a room with Jupiter, that child would not walk out the same? Probably not if they walked out at all. Wow, that, you know, that is a scary thought to have. And it's unfortunate that he could be doing it right now and we don't know about it. Yeah, it is a very terrifying thought. I mean, that's one of the thoughts that came to my mind before deciding to leave my family was what what if I'm not here and he hurts one of my nieces what if I'm not here and he kills one of my nephews what if I'm not here I could have stopped it and then I kept having to remind myself that the what ifs aren't a reality until they become a reality. Okay, let's take a few breaths. It's funny that you said 11 um, was kind of the barrier between he would either sexually, maybe sexually abuse them or younger than 11, he would break them. It's funny because he said that 11 and above is his preferred age range. It's disgusting that he still thinks this way and it's disgusting that his mother let him you know grow up into the person he is now he she enabled his behavior and I hope he rots in prison just growing up I've had all this mentality of everyone else first and then I can be happy And sometimes that still carries over. So I guess in a way that saying this is partly that I'm okay with what happened to me as long as it doesn't happen to someone else. Kind of the same when you were getting strangled, right? You thought if, if, if he goes to jail for this, he won't hurt anybody else. Yeah, I would be okay with that. And he would have to live with the guilt of knowing he killed one of the very few people who has ever shown him kindness. That kind of makes me a little emotional because you are such a kind person and I don't think you deserved any of this happening to you. And I'm, and I'm glad that, you know, it seems like we're we're coming to a close of this chapter of your life, because I think that you're, grief, your anger should be, and your sadness should be justified by him getting what he deserves. And my hope is that by watching this, anybody that's watching this put pressure on the Nampa Police Department to look into this situation with Corbin, aka Jupiter, if they haven't already, you know, they've had about three months to to do something. And I haven't heard anything. I've sent emails. I've sent emails to multiple Nampa police email accounts. I sent emails to the chief of staff, no response. If even Jupiter's sister says that she hasn't been in contact with the police, you know, that really sucks because to me, that sounds like they're not doing anything. And that's unfortunate because as we said earlier, once he gets access to Wi-Fi, he's going to be doing the same things over and over that he did in the past. So my hope for you is for you guys are to put pressure on the Nampa Police Department, and hopefully we all can get justice for his victims and his sisters. Maybe there's a piece of evidence that is hidden that someone's not willing to share that should be shared to help. Is there anything else you want to say to my audience? Any, any other things that you think they would want to know or any things you want to leave with them? There's always going to be those memories. There's always going to be those little things that you're going to continue to look for in people 
that you know or that you grew up with, sometimes those things will not exist anymore. But if you're going through something like I am, my brother's always going to be my brother. I can't change that. My mom is always going to be my mom. It doesn't matter that they're doing bad stuff. Yes, they should be held accountable for all the bad. But in regards to your relationship with your family, no one can tell you what that relationship is supposed to be. They're always going to be your mom. They're always going to be your dad. They're always going to be part of your family, part of your history. But that doesn't mean that you that giving them up or telling them that you do not accept their actions and have to spend some years apart like I have, it, it, it doesn't change the, the fact that you, st you can still care about them and sometimes caring about them means letting them go. That's so powerful. And I think I can't wait to see where you, you go from this, getting That's your right. psychology degree, writing a book, being an advocate for a lot of a lot of people and i think that starts hopefully right now where where you get your message spread across mm -hmm. um i wanted to thank you so much for this amazing conversation we had and i hope that a lot of people can learn um that although jupiter is now a messed up person there were things in his childhood that, you know, led to this. He did not have a perfect childhood. You did not have a perfect childhood. You were both sexually abused by your older brother who is now in prison for doing things with minors. You're moving forward with your life, getting help with the things you need to go through and being so strong and being able to talk about this with, with me. I really do appreciate you and your, and your bravery. You letting, letting me have the opportunity to share that. Well, yes, he is my brother. I don't condone anything that he's doing and just letting me be able to share a part of my brother, whether it's those good memories of, us being stupid kids or the bad ones. I'm just happy that I could share my story with, yeah. with someone. Yeah. And to everybody watching this, this is not even 5% of her story. There are things that I've heard that, you know, left my mouth agape. Like I, there were times when we were talking on the phone and I just couldn't, I just couldn't believe what I was hearing. Mm -hmm. And obviously I, I want her to feel as comfortable. I wanted her to feel as comfortable as she could during this interview. So we're, we're not going to go deep into these things. Um, but I hope that everybody watching has a deeper understanding of what it was like to grow up with Jupiter. And I hope that you, you guys learned a lot. And if you're going through any of the things that was mentioned, that you can take this and apply it to your own life. Bye, guys.